W, zero, is that right? K zero. K zero. WFS. WFS. I knew there was a W. Um, so, what's that? And a zero. And a zero, yeah. <laughs> Most people have a zero, so you're safe for that one. Hey, I was going to present this on op amps today, so take a look around. Yeah, I was going to. I was going to make the topic of today's talk, I hate road construction, <laughs> but I figured what well, we all do right now, so, which is why it was late, because I was coming down 494, and people were stopping for God knows what reason, because so, I was coming, because yeah, I, I was in a hurry. Right? Okay, so I chose this topic. Um, because, long story short, we all know that through-hole components are becoming more and more scarce. I happen to sell them, I, I try to obtain them, sell them on eBay, um, have got stockpiles when I can get stockpiles of them, um, but eventually they're going to run out. The, some of the manufacturers, like uh, recently on Semiconductor, which spun off from Motorola, Announced that they're, they've shut, they're shut, they've shut their lines down for the transistors. So your J310s uh, that that were popular that they made, um, your 2N4401s, etc., are not are no longer being made. And so the distributors are just selling them off. And surprisingly, they're selling them off cheap. They're not even selling them off at a premium. True. So. Uh, but eventually it's going to run out. And the other reason, the other motivation for covering it um, is that in modern times, operational amps, as we'll see, have come a long way. And they've come into the realm of being usable now in HF frequencies, a uh, little bit in the VHF, but mostly for HF frequencies, and especially for projects like Craig does at 40 meters or projects at 20 meters, uh, that's not all that high anymore for op amps. So I thought it would be a good time to, to, to bring the subject up, kind of go through it. Okay, so we'll go through a little history. Um, it's going to be an eye test, I guess. i got to remember to make these fonts bigger. Um, the ideal op amp models, um, the some of uh, about the lingo about the operating parameters and what they mean and which ones are important, especially um, for high frequency operation. Uh, the power supply rails and what's happened with, with that, those over time. Um, some common circuits and then some information. Now, um, I labeled this part one simply because this topic is so broad, I could cover an intro into it uh, within a reasonable amount of time with hopefully not going over. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I can talk a while. <laughs> and then allow for some specific ham circuits of interest or ham interest uh, uh, radio circuits that would be of interest to you guys, okay? Because again, these things have come a long way. So that'll be part two maybe August or September or whatever. Great. I'll go through some of the, the intro into this uh, a second time at that point just to refresh everybody's memory that's here and for the folks that couldn't make it today that are at the next one. Okay, so the first op amps, and let me pull this back just a little bit more if I can. Try to get a little bit more out of this. Maybe. The first op operational amplifier was created out of a need for relaying telephone signals across copper. Um, back in the early days of the telephone system, uh, they couldn't go very far without picking up a lot of noise on the copper wires. And really nobody wanted to hear a bunch of snap, crackle, and pops in the receiver when they were talking to their friends. So uh, a guy by the name of Harry Black came up with a differential amplifier that would allow, essentially a current amplifier, that would allow long distances in, of transmission with relatively low noise levels. Um, from there, 
uh, the idea of the operational amplifier kind of started to catch on. Um, people in the physics community especially were building analog computers using operational amplifiers as building blocks, computational blocks. Uh, they're called operation ampli operational amplifiers because they can perform mathematical operations. It's very simple, but they do it in an analog way rather than today's digital uh, way of doing things. In 52, uh, a company by the name of George A. Philbrick researchers, uh, researchers rather, um, released a K2W, which was a two dual triode amplifier with a gain control knob on it. It had differential inputs and differential outputs and um, also required, it plugged into an octal socket and required plus and minus 300 volts to, for operation. Uh, its output swing was plus or minus 50 volts. So it was a little bit inefficient, but it worked well and it was good for rough service for the most part because they had packaged it in a brick, they called it, in such a way that the tubes wouldn't come loose. And so you take the brick with the octal plug on it and plug, plug these things in and to octal sockets. Kind of a nice little, little approach. In 65, Fairchild Semiconductor came out with the, with the 709. That was the first silicon integrated circuit op amp. And the 709 uh, was around for a few years. People got a feel for it. But the 709 had a tendency to do two things, uh, create a lot of noise and run away and oscillate and or explode. <laughs> so not good qualities either of them. But uh, that they followed it up in 68 with the 741. And I'm sure many or all of you have heard of the 741 op amp. The 741 was a lot more stable and uh, much more predictable, much easier to work with, and it became a staple for many years for Fairchild. Uh, the knockoffs didn't even come until years later, and Fairchild enjoyed a monopoly while the market was taking off before others could come in and, and start doing knockoffs of the 741, like National Semiconductor, for example. Um, the, today, there are thousands of op amp part numbers. And they can do everything from almost DC to daylight. Uh, the highest ones I've seen most recently, uh, which are analog devices, which they picked up from Hittite, acquiring uh, that company. They go to 10 gigahertz gain product bandwidth. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. So they're not anything like a 741, right? Um, they have the ability to handle uh, high bandwidth communications, high bandwidth amplification, and not os oscillate or blow up, right? So, um, and oh, and they also have rails, power supply rails that can go as low as 0.9 volts all the way up to, to 1,000 volts on the rail. So they're, they're trying to cover a very broad range of applications for operational amplifiers. Uh, some low power, low uh, uh, current consumption, all the way up to industrial applications. Okay, now, the, an ideal op amp is, uh, does not exist, of course, right? It's ideal, uh, and you'll understand why in a second here, just reading through this. Uh, it would have infinite input impedance. It would have zero input current, so any voltages applied to the inputs uh, would not produce any current drain in and of themselves, um, save the, the actual feedback circuits and such. Um, it has zero voltage difference between the plus input and the minus input, uh, the differential input in, in terms of what that voltage difference is. Largely that stems from the fact that whether ideal or real, the output will try to adjust itself with the proper feedback circuitry, which we'll see, um, to make that uh, relationship true, that the two term the voltage difference between the plus and the minus terminals are in fact zero, or very close to zero, at least. Um, they have zero output impedance, so they can be a perfect current source in that regard. Um, and they have infinite gain 
infinite output voltage and infinite current sources, which of course none of them in reality actually have. Although some people, I guess, with the 709 maybe tried that. Um, okay, so there are two topologies uh, with single-ended op-amp applications. Single-ended, much like when you drive or look at um, coax versus ladder line, right? Uh, coaxial feeds are single-ended and ladder line are, are uh, balanced. So you have uh, both cases there, you have both cases here. You have a, a non-inverting case which brings the input into the plus terminal. You have a feedback network com consisting of two resistors, one called the feedback resistor, labeled RF on there, and the other one called the gain resistor which sets the gain for the amplification, uh, labeled RG on there. Um, with the non-inverting cases, you get a gain of one to about two. Uh, and it's actually kind of hard to even get up to two. So pretty much they're just used for buffers. They don't change the signal. They don't shift the phase of an AC signal 180 degrees. They don't uh, change the polarity of a DC signal at all. So what's in comes out and there are ap actual applications for buffering. Uh, the non-inverting case is much more common. When you, if you were to look up op-amp circuits via Google or in a book, in the Radio Amateur's Handbook or whatever book on electronic uh, you favor, you're going to find circuits in there on op-amp, and most of them are going to favor the, the inverting case. Uh, the main reason for that is that is the gain equation. Even though it'll shift AC signals 180 degrees in terms of phase, uh, even though it'll take a DC positive input and create it a negative out of it at, at times the multiplication factor, um, it's still a very handy um, topology because you can get 20, 30, 40 dB of gain out of these circuits uh, with just a couple of resistors and a couple of capacitors, so for coupling. Um, the current here that flows in uh, through the gain resistor and through the feedback resistor to the output from the input uh, is equal. And because the feedback resistor typically will be larger than the gain re resistor, the ratio of the voltage out to the voltage in, uh, minding the, the sign uh, for inversion, equals just that feedback resistance ratio, uh, or star, sorry, feedback resistance divided by the gain resistor um, as a ratio. So it's a very simple amp to co circuit to come up with. If you want to gain a 10, you need a, a factor of 10 difference on those resistors. Now, one thing that is quite confusing, but I've tried to simplify here, is the common mode voltage. Uh, the idea of the common mode voltage is also something that people refer to in terms of offset, DC offset. So if you have an AC input uh, and you look at the output, DC coupled on an oscilloscope, you may see an offset plus or minus. Uh, you'll see the amplification of the input sine wave, but you'll also see an offset there. Uh, there are various techniques for correcting or nulling that offset. Uh, which, in effect, all boil down to taking either the plus or the minus terminal, feeding a reference voltage to it, making adjustments, which are done internally nowadays, but externally you can make adjustments and essentially bring that offset to null, to zero volt. Uh, in the days of the 741, the 741 had two pins on it for offset null. And that's what you did, is you put a potentiometer between the two pins, and, and the feed voltage is in there between a, a, a voltage divider network going into the common wiper and then you could wipe positive or negative to essentially shift the offset. The, the point of this though is why is common mode voltage an issue at all? Well, as it turns out, everything coming into the input is amplified. So if you have an amplification factor of times 10, then that DC offset coming in gets multiplied times 10. 
so it gets a lot bigger and it becomes a bigger problem. So being able to null is, is a nice thing. Uh, and then you could say, well, or your question might be, well, I can just isolate that circuit with capacitors. I can have an input capacitor, and I can have an output capacitor, which is true. And that, no, that offset would not bother me at all in an AC circuit, except within a narrow band of frequencies, that's true. As you start to have the reactive components kick in more and more, it changes the, the actual gain and feedback of the operational amplifier. And then you start to see high and low pass filter effects in that. So within a narrow range of frequencies, let's say at audio, you could essentially ignore the offset. And in fact, usually that is the case. Okay, gain product bandwidth is uh, the gain of the circuit that you've configured set with the, the gain and feedback resistors uh, times the highest frequency of operation for that circuit. Um, the way it's really used is that you'll take the gain and divide it into the gain bandwidth product. Let's say it's 100, you have a gain of 10, then it would, uh, 100 megahertz, and it divided by a gain of 10, would give you a 10 megahertz bandwidth in theory. In practice, it actually is less than 10 megahertz in that case. And traditionally, that's why op amps haven't found a whole lot of use at IF or RF frequency until much more recently. Because the gain product bandwidth of 100 megahertz only 20 years ago was a lot. That was a, that was a pretty high, fast, uh, operational amplifier. Um, nowadays, as I say, they're in the gigahertz range, and now if you divide that by 10, or even 100, you start to get into the HF frequencies with an appreciable amount of gain, and more importantly, an appreciable amount of stability. So you don't have to worry so much about ringing or oscillations uh, like you used to have to. Analog devices uh, is I'm calling them out because they conveniently provide a 3 dB point bandwidth. And we're all used to seeing that kind of specification. So if an operational amplifier is um, uh, specced at having a minus 3 dB bandwidth of 50 megahertz, we, know, we understand what that means. Uh, what they don't tell you until you read the fine print is that's with a gain of one. Okay, so you have a gain of one, meaning that if I had 37 megahertz coming in, let's say, use a ham frequency, 28 megahertz coming in, I got 28 megahertz coming out of essentially roughly the same amplitude. That's okay if, if I'm doing filtering, though, right? And it's okay if I'm doing filtering in an IF to some degree. Uh, typically, you need much higher power levels in IF, but uh, the point is, is that that's a, that's a $5 part. That's not a super expensive part. They can be had for much cheaper than $5. That's just the list price. Uh, you can get parts now that are several hundred megahertz of gain product bandwidth up to a gigahertz, and now you're starting to look at a 3 dB bandwidth of several hundred megahertz. And with that, you at unity gain, uh, you back that up to 7 megahertz or 14 megahertz, now all of a sudden you can do 30 or 40 dB of gain in the circuit, which is a times 10 or 40 dB. So, again, they've come a long way. Um, now, some things that are important in doing RF circuits. I thought I'd cover this as kind of a lead-in to part two. Um, but the input capacitance, as we know, uh, is an, an issue, whether we're using uh, dedicated integrated circuits uh, specifically for HF frequencies, for IFs or RF amplifiers, uh, MMICs for, amplific for RF amplification, whatnot. Uh, we tend to want to have relatively low input capacitances there uh, for a number of reasons, right? Uh, matching not the least of which, but um, to today you can get uh, find op amps that run as low as one picofarad with an input impedance of several tera ohms, so almost infinite for all intents and purposes, and to more than 100 picofarads at maybe 100k input impedance. 
know, that's more indicative of the way op amps were 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but today, it's more common to find them at one or two, three, four, five picofarads input capacitor. And that's helping uh, drive the high frequency applications as well. Um, the supply rails, uh, uh, the classic op amps, like the 741, came out with a specification for the supply rails of plus and minus 15 volts. Um, that meant you could run up to plus and minus 15 volts. It didn't mean it was required. But for maximum swing in the output and being able to use all of that amplification that was possible, 15 plus or minus 15 volts became a standard. And today you still see uh, power supplies that are rated at plus minus 15 or plus minus 12 and plus 5. And that's why. That's from the legacy of, of op amps and analog circuits. Um, today, um, there's two things that have, that have happened <coughs> with them. Uh, but uh, the point... Sorry, skipped over a point. The a plus one volt input, for example, with a gain of three, uh, 10 dB, would give you an output voltage of minus three volts, well within that 30 volts of swing. And that's essentially what op amps do at DC. The input voltage causes an amplification following at the output, just like any other amplifier would, would do, except at DC rather than just at uh, uh, AC, for example. <coughs> Okay, um, so dual rails obviously increase cost in the power supplies. Uh, certainly a uh, two output or three output supply is gonna cost you more than a single output supply. Um, they, they create problems even with batteries. Uh, years ago, 70s, 80s, people were using op amps and they'd use two nine volt batteries to get the, the split rail. And so that was a very common thing to see. Uh, but that's kind of a pain and nine volt batteries don't last very long anyway. And the current draw that those op amps, those early op amps saw was, uh, was many milliamps, not microamps like today. So those nine volt batteries didn't last very long. So what's happened over time is we've gone to a single, a single rail. And in going to a single rail, uh, the manufacturers have tried to continue to achieve rail-to-rail uh, -rail operation on the output. So if I have a five volt uh, power supply operational amplifier, I can get almost four and a half, 4.7 volts output. Sometimes a little higher even than that. With, with whatever input combined with whatever amplification or multiplication factor I have in terms of uh, voltage swing. Obviously, if I, if I want to take uh, and compare this to a bipolar transistor that I've got 12 volts on, I can see with a high beta, high uh, gain transistor, I can see with very little swing on the input, a very large output, probably with some distortion. So op amps really are best cascaded in stages. They're not really so much meant for single op amp applications, except for in circuits like filtering, uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the most common circuits uh, that are out there all over the place are the filters, and they're filtering at audio frequencies typically. Um, for us, that makes them effective audio filters for CW work. Um, that makes them okay for audio amplifiers, which of course there's plenty of in, in the way of um, dedicated audio amplifiers, uh, like in Craig's receiver and paired up all the time with, with the LM386, paired up all the time with the NE602 or 612 type of architectures. Um, so while you can use an uh, an op amp for audio purposes for your receivers uh, or for amplification of a microphone, uh, they don't still see a lot of use yet in amateur radio circuits. A little bit here and there. If anything, mostly it seems on the input side of a microphone and a transceiver uh, because you have uh, one of the modes you have with operational amplifiers is called a transimpedance amplifier. So you can do matching very effectively to get 
uh, a microphone of one impedance matched to a circuit, an input circuit for amplification of usually a much lower impedance. Um, but for the most part, the filters are interesting in terms of learning about op amps. So in the lab, they become very handy and very inexpensive to put together and test with because you need audio level signals to drive them. You need a scope preferably to look at the output. Uh, and you only need a handful of components. You may need three or four components and you're, you're ready to, to actually start playing with op amps. And the the low-pass um, filter works by simply, as you know, the, the in the feedback between the output there, across the feedback resistor, that capacitor at higher frequencies is going to become zero or tend to go to zero in terms of its impedance, right? So that in parallel with that feedback resistor is going to tend to short things out at high frequencies. And when that wire, if you will, replace that resistor and capacitor with just a, a wired connection and just and leaving the gain resistor in there essentially brings the gain down to in the negative range and it starts to become an attenuator. How much depends on the value of, of the uh, gain resistor. The higher that gain resistor is, the more attenuation you're going to get, just like you would intuitively guess. Um, in the filters, we'll look at a high pass now. Uh, actually, this is a non-inverting configuration. Both filters can go both ways. They can be non-inverting or inverting as far as uh, the topologies and how you set things up. Um, every stage of an op amp with op amp filters uh, is an order. So if you're trying to build a fourth order filter, trying to build a sixth order filter that has very sharp cut roll-offs uh, in its frequency response, you, you basically add one stage for every order that you're looking for. And you simply cascade them together. You try to keep the gain relatively low so things don't get crazy because you can't exceed the rail-to-rail -rail swing. Um, so most of the filter applications that you see typically have gains of one, two, three times, but pretty close to one pretty close to unity gain. Uh, and in the inverting case that works, or non-inverting case that works out, uh, pretty close to unity gain anyway. So you'll see filters with both negative feedback and positive, or excuse me, uh, inverting and non-inverting uh, topologies, uh, both. And again, each stage is in order. Um, there are Chebyshev, Bessel, uh, elliptic filters, Salon key filters, you name it. Every kind of filter you can do a passive component, you can do with an, uh, an op amp. And basically what you're doing is taking the, t the network, the passive network, and wiring it into the feedback of the, of the amplifier. There's gonna be one, at least one resistor in there anyway, okay? Um, doesn't have to be, but typically there is for other reasons like noise immunity and such. You can have an RLC network in the feedback and, and essentially get that feedback. What it does is it provides the inverse of what you, what you want your filter to do um, as negative feedback, right? So. So if you have a resistor capacitor filter network right. that was passive, you would take that same thing and put it on your negative feedback of the op amp right. and get the same effect. You'll get a very similar effect, that's right. Okay. Uh, if you are careful in how you wire it, you can get the exact same effect, but you have a couple of different choices. If you think about it, you've got two input terminals and there's multiple topologies for feedback, okay? Um, so that'll, that'll maybe get covered in part two a little bit more, but essentially the answer to your question is yes. It, you can take an, an LC, or excuse me, an RC network that would give you a low pass filter effect or a high pass filter effect, put it in parallel, put it in series with respect to the feedback and get the exact same effect. And with the band band pass? Correct, okay. correct. Well, that's what's up there right now is band pass. Okay. So this is an example of 
something um, that would be a, a circuit that would be worth uh, playing around with at home in the lab. I'll just click ahead. What I've done here is I've put the real values in. You've got 1900 ohm for R1 and R4. R4 is next to R3 between the two capacitors up there. Uh, you've got uh, an R3, which is next to R4, again between the two capacitors, of 38K, and an R2 of 100 ohm. The gain of the circuit is set up at 10. The center frequency is set up at 400 hertz. It can be a little higher, of course. Um, the two capacitors uh, across those two resistors uh, on the input side are 100 picofarads each, and the input and output capacitors are 0.1 microfarads. So very common values. You get a center right around 400 hertz, <coughs> and uh, because you get, you've got a gain of 10, you get essentially enough roll off there um, to get it so that you can uh, reject audio frequencies on the si either side of, say, a CW tone. Why do they typically use two then, one for the low pass, one for the high pass? Do they get a, a sharper uh, spirit set up then? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. That's right. Because yeah, yeah, this sounds like the ideal way to go, but I see most of or a lot of them use two of them. Right. Two separate. Right. And of course, this is first order because there's one stage. If you cascade it, two more of this, you can have a third <coughs> order. And the skirts on the graph there are going to drop down real sharp. Okay. Okay. The gain in this configuration is, is a very specific band yeah. path configuration uh, because it's highly stable and tends yeah. not to isolate like some of the other ones or ring like some of the other configurations or more simpler configurations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Q is equal to the gain in this configuration. So if you, you can crank up the gain a little bit more, but most of these filters, if you get too high a Q, will actually start to oscillate. Yeah. So you typically shoot for about 10. That's still a nice though, that's a nice circuit there. Yeah, because you've got a you've got about 40 dB within uh, you know a few dozen hertz either way. That's good for them. Right. So the idea of this would be that if applied in circuit, then you're tuning your way, you tune in a CW station you flick this on, right? And you guys would set this according to the tone that you prefer. Some of you prefer 800, 600, 400, what have you. You'd set it up so that it would be near there or make it adjustable, in fact, which is not hard to do, actually. And um, then be able to tune the station in and reject all of that other close-in audio that's there, especially the high frequencies in particular and anything that's coming in near zero B. Right, that stuff would just be right out of there. So, I liked this circuit so much, I decided um, to <coughs> act as payment for sitting through this presentation. <laughs> I've got a ton of op amps that'll work great in this, um, this particular configuration. I've got all the caps and resistors um, practically buried in them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get little breakout boards and then at the next presentation, everybody will get a breakout board and off amp, the resistors and the capacitors, right? And then you'll be able to take that home and start playing around with these circuits. Now you don't have to build this one, but the breakout board will allow you to build any one of the off amp circuits that are very common. So that way, you guys can get some hands on with this because hearing this, isn't gonna do much for you, right? It's, it goes in one ear and kinda out the other until you can put your hands Except on it. filters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good pun. <laughs> it's, a, it's a band stop function. <laughs> All right, so the amateur radio applications, which would be much more interesting than this dry subject matter, um, for part two would be filters that'll go to at least 10 megahertz so that they can be used in IF stages uh, or of course even, uh, even beyond that. Uh, audio amplifiers, uh, gotta cover that. Um, peak detectors, uh, in particular peak detectors uh, and ideal diode product detectors are of interest because of being able to build accurate RF voltmeters, 
being able to uh, create very nice, very linear AM radio detectors with op amp, um, and then slight, no, no pun intended, shift. FFK demodulators uh, for BPSK circuitry to actually do decode. Um, of course, nowadays you have software to do that with your audio inputs on your, your PC, so why bother probably, but. Um, and the, probably the most interesting too are the mixer circuits, the RFIQ modulators, demodulators, um, where we'll see uh, how easy it is to go from, uh, to essentially build your own software defined radio. Um, it is, with the SDR software that's out there now, um, pre a pretty simple matter to get SDR in the HF range, okay? So yeah, there's the dongles out there and the cheaper SDR rigs and all that, but what I'll show you is how to basically breadboard an SDR radio that'll give you your I and Q, and then use SDR sharp to, uh, to do the receiver. Perfect, looking forward to it. Yeah. So that'll at least be more interesting than, you know, watching blips on a scope, hopefully. <laughs> so that'll be part two. And then I put some references in, or I, I sent this to you, Steve, before the, the meeting. Okay. So if you have it in your inbox. Um, check out the Philbrick archive. It's got some really cool pictures and really cool history about the early op amps. Um, neat stuff, if you're into those tube things. <laughs> Um, a book I highly recommend that I took some screenshots out of is Op Amps for Everyone. Uh, don't buy it because it's available out there. Just search for Op Amps for Everyone in Google and you'll find umpteen PDFs of it out there. So you don't really need to buy it. TI used to and still does give it away because it was an application note at one time. Uh, and then they started publishing it just to get, it became such a large application note that it had to be put in book form. And so basically now Nunes has picked it up and Nunes Press wants, I think, 38 bucks just for the printing. Uh, if you can deal with a PDF or if you're used to using PDFs, just get the darn thing and download it, okay? But this book is the book for op amp circuits. It covers RF, it covers IF, it covers uh, analog, analog to digital, basically everything and anything that has to do with op amps. And if you get the third edition, 2009, you'll see part numbers in there that you can easily buy and they're relatively inexpensive at this point. Many of them are under a dollar in, in cost. And then of course the two big players, Linear, Tech, TI, I left out TI, I shouldn't have left out TI, uh, and then analog devices uh, at those addresses. So, oh, any questions? What is slew rate? Ah, good question. All right, so slew rate is a common uh, parameter in spec sheets for op amps. And what it has to do with is what your rise time on a perfect square wave pulse input gives you. So let's say you have input into an op amp test circuit, a uh, five volt pulse. It's gonna go from zero to five volt with within a couple of nanoseconds rise. Right? It's gonna be something very small. Uh, and the reason for that is because the test parameter is labeled in microvolt um, per second. Volts per microsecond, sorry, thank you. Volts per microsecond. So today's op amps, it's not unusual to find slew rates of four or 5,000 volts per microsecond. Um, that ideal pulse in will look very much on the way out like it went in. So if you have a very expensive pulse generator, or even a less expensive pulse generator, it can do at least 50 megahertz pulses, you'll see that newer op amps will not uh, create a lot of delay in that rise and fall on that pulse. <clears throat> what it <clears throat> more importantly relates to is how fast the, the, the op amps can respond to input. And the faster they can respond, the more linear they are, and the more linear they are, the better the, uh, at higher frequencies they are. You get less distortion, and it's, it's directly, although I don't fully understand this yet, but it, it is directly related to stability as well with regards to oscillation. So it's an important factor uh, in, pick, in picking off amps. Um, 
there's a tendency with op amps uh, because it's largely true that more is better or higher is better than lower. So uh, a gigahertz bandwidth is going to be better than a 250 megahertz op band. But that isn't necessarily the case. For one thing, the 250 megahertz bandwidth op amp may have a much, much higher slew rate than the gigahertz one has. Just depends on the part. Uh, but um, there's about, in this book, Op Amps for Everyone, uh, they go through an entire chapter dedicated to every one of the Op Amp specs, which ones are important and why. So again, it's a great book. It's got about 28 chapters in it. It's just very comprehensive. Good question. Is the uh, power supply usually filtered some way? Like a bypass capacitor? Yes. Yeah. Um, there's another spec called noise immunity, and if you don't have a lot of noise immunity, you got you want to be particularly careful as to what the DC supply rail looks like or rails look like. Um, many of them now are achieving 70, 80, 90 dB of noise immunity on the power, and of course, the power itself today is much cleaner than it was, you know, say 20, 30 years ago. Don't have the 60 cycle hum even down at, in the millivolts today that you, that you did then. So um, it, it's not in practice much of a problem and any of your bench supplies have way more, um, are way more pure than they even need to be with modern op amps. So what noise factor is it? Yeah, another good question. So noise factor on op amps is one of the things that still limits their use a little bit. Um, noise factor in terms of, of decibel, if you can get, in, like a low noise amplifier for RF, for front end preamp, is gonna be down less than about five dB, preferably lower than that. There are amplifiers for VHF and UHF that are out there that are below a dB of noise factor. And what that really is saying is that the, the noise coming in isn't further amplified a heck of a lot by that circuit, even though it's broadband. Uh, broadband tends to suggest that, that random noise will also get amplified. Um, but low noise amps are good at, at rejecting that and not amplifying that. That largely Gaussian noise that's there. Um, op amps typically run anywhere from 5 dB to 10 dB noise factor. So they're a bit higher. Um, they're certainly not well suited for front end amplifiers, right, before a mixer. Uh, and they do limit in mixer applications to some degree because the noise factor is a bit high. Yeah. Yeah. Now this may be a little off the topic, but you said something earlier about software defined radio that we're going to get into. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we cover part two, what I'm going to show you is how you you go from something called a switch capacitor filter topology, and get an I derive an I and Q from that with two op amps, and then you have your I and Q right there uh, to essentially feed into from what essentially looks like um, a direct conversion front end. So it'll go from direct conversion front end using sampling and then uh, derive the I and the Q with two op amps, and then you feed that into your, your stereo inputs on a PC, use a, an SDR Sharp or an HD SDR type of software program, and you've got essentially what you have with a soft drop. So you can receive uh, cross the HF band in SDR, and demod that with the software, doing the digital signal processing in the software. But the, the point is the front end hardware is very minimal. There's really not much that you need in the front end to do an SDR. Like another build design. Yeah, maybe. And also I don't know the place where it was, so small projects like that are very appealing. Yeah. yeah. That'd be a great build design project. Well, maybe. Maybe that's the way to do it. Yeah. Kind of a summer build design now? Well, whatever. Whenever we do it, you know. <laughs> You know, we, we talked about two a year, so maybe this could be the other one this year. November's when you have the next one. So, but maybe we can set it up and it would yeah. be a wonderful topic if there would be a lot of interest in that one. So.
Okay. Yeah, we can do something like that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You sure. mentioned the use of an op amp as a detector. Right. How does that work? Um, you put a diode that's non-ideal in the, the uh, back end of the feedback path, in the input path. Okay? Okay. All right. It okay. makes it ideal because it linearizes through the feedback. It makes the diode act more linear. So the relationship between the voltage and current gets more linear than it is with a regular old diode, like a 1N914, for example. And uh, with that, then, if you bring it an amplitude modulated envelope, it can detect that and not add distortion to it. So the total harmonic distortion on the output drops significantly with an ideal diode versus a regular diode product detector. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, who came up with the idea of feedback? What was what was their thinking? How did they discover? Well, there were a couple of guys that worked on that. Bodie was one of them. Uh, you probably heard of Bodie plots when you look at linear logarithmic uh, plots of frequency response, and then you go into pole zero plots. You look at something called a Bodie plot. Um, I don't remember the other other guy that was involved, and it wasn't Shannon. But essentially, Harry Black, when he started down this path at Bell Labs, um, was trying to take some research that had been done at the theoretical, not applied yet theoretical level. Uh, in the, I think that research was done in the 30s, even though he came along and did this much later, um, and was trying to find a practical application for negative feedback. From control systems theory um, is really what, where its origins are. So if you have a system where you have a voltage in an amplification factor, which you don't want to have happen under certain variation, varying conditions on the input, is you don't want that circuit to run away. In other words, you don't want that voltage to essentially try to go up to the top or go down to the bottom rail and distort, but also just kind of run away and stay there. If you take the, and feed back the output in a, and invert it, you say, okay, now when that output increases, I've got a feedback path to apply a little bit of the opposite to hold down the input, much like an AGC circuit, then I can, through negative feedback, have a much more stable closed loop circuit at that point. Um, that doesn't quite answer your question because you asked more of a historical question of well, who was, worked was on it. Was there a mechanical version of the electronic feedback? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but that's kind of... Yeah. Um, like a damper on a string, kind of. Right. Yeah, yeah. because they always show that string mm -hmm. just went into oscillation. Uh, you know, the horizontal and the outward or whatever. And oh, the, the bridge. The bridge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eventually just distorted. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right, that's an example of a runaway oscillation, destructive runaway oscillation, that's right. It's a pretty cool video. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, John. So it seemed like the uh, load is pretty important uh, part of the design, in other words, to drive it into because it really carries across the feedback resistor. Correct. It's really part of the feedback resistor, isn't it, in some ways, so you have to be kind of careful. It absolutely is. If, if it goes to ground, it that's right. One's going into a virtual ground feedback resistor, and then the load's going into a uh, regular ground. Right. So, so, one of the things you have to be careful of because the gain can, is set by that ratio is you could have a 1 meg resistor and a 100k resistor. That's, a, that's 10. You could have a 10 ohm resistor and a 1 ohm resistor. Well, you wouldn't do that because that's going to present impedances under normal operation that are going to be way too low. On the other hand, you may have to match the output, and of course a matched output is more efficient than an unmatched output. So really what you're doing too, when you get into AC signal analysis with op amps, is you're trying to do exactly what you would do with transistor amplifiers and couple stages by impedance matching as well as other factors. So. Yeah, and you're right. If you go, there are op amps, uh, current feedback op amps that can drive fairly <coughs> low impedance loads. 
50 ohm coax, 75 ohm coax, much more common with 75 because of cable TV. Um, and those current feedback amps operate at much higher frequencies. Um, they have some drawbacks, so they're not perfect for our purposes, but um, they very much can drive a, a low impedance load compared to the typical op amp, which is usually driving a much higher impedance load, maybe 600 ohms, maybe 1,000 ohms, typically. Anything else?